Sorry, Barry, I know people at home are screaming. You can't leave it there. Give us another story. Well, I do have plenty of stories, actually, but one, one I can bring to mind now was uh, probably about 10 years ago, Musselburgh Trot. Biggest, one of the biggest trots of the year. Um, all the Irish are over, you know, great meeting, 12, ooh, 14 races of real competitive fare, basically. Anyway, the biggest race of the day came up. Uh, it was the Musselburgh, um, the Musselburgh free for all. Uh, always, always, everybody wants to win this. Always a good betting race. Now there's a horse come over, well, there was three or four Irish horses in the race. Um, good betting race. Anyway, so I'm standing there, I've taken around about three, three and a half thousand, even money shot. I've got, I've stood that for probably about 1,500 quid, uh, thinking, well, I'm gonna get a few more in this race. Anyway, so I priced up on the board. One of, a good Irish punter comes up to me. Um, don't see him too often, but when you do, you think, mm, yeah, you, you know, you know the time of day. So he comes up to, sidles up to me, pen on, pen on. Pen on, yeah. You got eight to one me horse, what's the best price? Well, well, to be honest with you, you know, that's probably round about right to one. Come on, come on, give us tens. I said, well, how much are you having on? He said, I'm having a grand on. I'm having a grand. That's it. So, you're having a... so I'm thinking, bloody hell, you want me to lay you 10,000 for one? I know the horse, good horse. Um, didn't think it would quite suit the track. A horse called Portstown Jack. And I'm thinking, right, okay, well, it's a good betting race. I've got an even money shot in the race. I've got a six to four, I've got a five to two. I'm betting quite well. I said, well, how much are you having on? Pin on, pin on, that's all I'm having. I'm just having this grand. Right, I said, okay, I'll do it for you. You can have a 10,000 for one. So as soon as he gets his money out of his pocket like this, the next minute, it's like a Mexican wave all the way down the line. Bang, 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 bang. All, all the rest of his cronies have dived in on most of the other bookmakers all down the line. And I'm looking down. I actually had a foreman working for me then. Oh, come on, get me two on, 10 to one, the two horse. You know, the one on, the, the two horse. Anyway, all gone, all down the line. He managed to get, the very last man, he managed to get a couple hundred quid on for me, to be fair. I stood the horse, so of course I'm fuming, absolutely fuming. You know, he's walked away, the boss, the owner's walked away. I'm absolutely fuming, thinking I've been stitched up here. Still got a good chance, it's a cracking free-for-all. So anyway, lo and behold, I've got it for four and a half thousand quid, which is like, my maximum normally be a grand 1500. If I have to stand one, I will. And I was winning on the day, so I was winning a few bob. So I could afford it, it still maybe put me behind on the day, but I could afford to stand it. And this is how you, you, you think as a bookmaker. So, of course, I've got it for four and a half grand. Couldn't get out of it, it collapses. It actually returns four to one. So I could have taken it under the odds, but I'm not one for that either. If I've laid one at a price, very, very, very rarely will I take one under the odds, I, I stung it. So of course, I'm watching this horse in fifth, in fourth. There's four in line coming to the furlong post and this horse is about two, two lengths behind. Absolutely coming like mad, coming like mad, coming like mad. I'm watching it, I'm thinking, I know what's gonna happen here, I know what's gonna happen here. The part of the Red Sea in front of it, it gets his nose right on the line, short head. There's four of them, the one drops away, there's four of them across the line and this porter down jack, right bang, with the cap, right on the line. Four and a half grand worse off. And, he, and I've never seen anybody with, with so many pockets bulging, he looked like the Michelin man as he walked off. But it was uh, a fair play to him, good gambler, but uh, a nice coup, but he, he was naughty because this is how you trust people, and he let me down saying that was the only thousand pound he was having on. It was all down the line. Well, Barry, you must be like one of the, you are a dyed in the wool professional bookmaker. What's the best and worst thing about your life as in inverted commas, commas, a journeyman bookie? Um, well, I think a journeyman bookie, the, the best thing is you get to travel quite a lot. Okay, all right, as you get older, you don't quite like, like you traveling here today to Ludlow. It's taking you about five hours, isn't it, from uh, Taunton? So that can happen. You know, uh, you do sort of get sick of the sight of uh, being behind a tractor and, you know, lorries doing about 30 miles an hour at times. However, um, I think the, the best times of me bookmaking was definitely booking tickets, that without doubt, because I think with booking tickets, you, you had an, an, an affinity, an affinity with, with the punters. Um, you would basically initially give out a, a ticket. You would then uh, say, oh yeah, what's your, what's your name? If they come back two or three times, get to know them, say, oh, you don't need a ticket, Gerald or, or Jimmy or Ginger or, you know, um, you don't need a ticket. You'd have that affiliation with people. So you'd have that trust between you and the punter. Um, okay, there, there's a case that, that you, you, in the old days, you'd have a few more people leave you on. Um, that would that stands to reason. It shouldn't happen, but it does because you, you basically down a down a down a red. Yeah, pay me, pay me later on, and you wouldn't see them, you know, for 
a couple of years and, and then they'd ignore you. So from that point of view, that, that, that wasn't great, but you, you would have an association with your punter and the punter would trust you as well. You haven't given them a ticket, the punter would trust you. Whereas now everything's a lot more um, regulated now. Everything's a lot more uh, on the race courses. It's regimental, it's all, it's all a bit mechanical. Uh, so I don't, I don't like that about the, 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 uh, the betting these days, I must admit. So, and if you've got a good clerk and a good head in the old days, booking tickets, you would be a step ahead of you, the, the chap next to you. Or I'd like to think I was, um, especially on a busy day, if you've got a good clerk who can really write 100 miles an hour. So from that point of view, I would like to, I would like to go back to those days. But, but travelling up and down the length of the country, I got to Scotland, I put the golf clubs in, brilliant, I love that. Go down to Devon, I see all my relatives. Um, you know, I can incorporate that as, as well. Uh, yeah, so I think also being your own boss. Being your own boss, you can't beat. Not answerable to anyone. Well, obviously, sometimes apart from the missus, but not answerable from anyone to anyone. Uh, you could, if you make any ricks, if you do any mistakes, it's down to yourself. And that's one thing I, I work on my own. I do, uh, I do find that working on my own, I, I struggle a little bit at times when I'm busy. However, I'm quite happy to crack on. I could do a thousand tickets a day, um, you know, I don't particularly enjoy having a clerk, it sounds stupid that, to help me out because I'd like to do the book myself. And I also think being on the front makes a big difference as well because people can recognise you. Now with all due respect to quite a lot of the other bookmakers, they'll put, they'll put somebody who they'll use every now and then occasionally and punters don't uh, recognise or they don't have that bond. Whereas with me being on the front, I have that bond, I like to think anyway, with quite a lot of punters who come up and they can recognise me, you know, whether it be the Tash or, or whatever. Um, they recognise me and they like to have a bet with me because in, in this day and age we're all generally the same prices so you need to you need to have something different whereby the punter can either know you uh, say hello three bags full to you uh, and they can think yeah they're all the same prices I'll bet with Pino or I'll bet with Barry or whatever so from that point of view uh, being on the front of the joint makes a big difference um, and also obviously I do I do the computer from the front as well so it sounds like quite an idyllic um, existence to everybody but I don't think it's a secret you had a health scare not so long ago. Um, should bookmaking also have a health as well as wealth warning? Yeah, well, uh, uh, to be quite honest with you, yes. But, I mean, they say it's a stressful business. Now, five years ago, uh, well, actually, it probably comes back to a little bit earlier than that. Seven years ago, I lost my dad. Now, my dad was a big uh, part of my life uh, from bookmaking, obviously, right the way through. I lost my mum at 39 and I lost my dad seven years ago through, unfortunately, CJD, which is... Um, a, a, a version, it was a, a version of Mad Cows. So uh, three months earlier I was playing golf with him, unfortunately then he passed away three, three months later. Uh, and uh, Coincidentally I was actually at Foss Lass, trading at Foss Lass that day. I've not been anywhere for two weeks because we were in the hospice. I then get a phone call at Foss Lass. Um, and I think Jane Hayes will probably vouch for this. I burst into tears, uh, you know, I'm not sorry to say, because uh, I was most upset when I, I got the call to say my, my father had passed away. And that was, a, that was a, if you like, quite a big shock. That was a big shock. The shock was my dad having CJD and knowing, um, basically looking into it, that it, it, he didn't know he had it. Um, unfortunately, it was, it was a, a big progressive uh, disease which sort of took him down downhill really quickly. And then reading into it, I, I knew then that there was no hope or no cure, really. So that was a big shock to me. And then five, two years after that, now whether this was connected with uh, my dad um, obviously passing away, I, uh, I was told they had uh, leukaemia. So I, I was told five years ago I've got leukaemia, which is chronic leukaemia. Uh, at the time, that was a big shock to me, obviously, uh, being told you've got cancer. Um, and leukaemia, which I, I didn't know too much about, looked into it. Uh, and they said, well, you, you've got cancer, but it looks like you've got a good type of cancer. OK, if you can have a good type of cancer, then I'm lucky I've got leukaemia. And I'm on a watch and wait, uh, which is um, unusual. I don't get any treatment. Um, mine's an indolent, a sort of lazy type of, of cancer. Um, so at some stage, unfortunately it will kick in, but luckily at the moment it's a slow burner. Um, I keep having checkups once a year and I'm very happy with my progress. Um, that, you know, uh, so I'm lucky on that, on that front, I can still go about my everyday business. Uh, however, two years after that, I then had a very, very minor heart attack. They called me in, uh, did me all the check over, and um, I had a angiogram, checked the heart, and I had three blocked arteries. So hence, they then said, I'm gonna to have to go in for a triple heart bypass. So about three weeks later, I went in, actually they had a sale on, and they did four, I had a quadruple. They had a bog off offer. <laughs> the best bog off offer I've probably ever had. 
Uh, so I had a quadruple bypass, um, and luckily enough, touch wood, um, I've been uh, I've been okay ever since. Obviously, I, I watch my, my eating and my, my food and everything else, cholesterol, try and keep all that down. So the old uh, the, the pies at the race courses and the chip butties on the way home have gone out the window. But uh, I try and look after myself as well as I can. On coming down to the original question, the stress, yes, okay, you've got stress on the stool, you stand a favourite, and it's 20 clear going to the last. You know, that obviously probably raises your blood pressure. Driving, that's a, a sense of pressure. Uh, everyday life, maybe. Although I'm not a, a stressful person, or I don't think I am, obviously that could possibly, um, you know, affect your health and, and uh, you know, your, your standard of living and everything else, really. So, so you not put that down to bookmaking, but what is the biggest problem that faces people like yourself, independent on-course bookmakers at the moment? Yeah, good question. I mean, uh, I mean, it's, it's it's widely known, isn't it? It's widely published about uh, apps, um, computers, exchanges. I mean, it, but when exchanges came along, you know, that was half a death knell for traditional inverted commas bookmakers like myself. Um, but obviously, then helped bookmakers coming along, or or you, you might have now turned into lions who can take big bets if you like, have most of it away in exchanges, green up, make a little profit for 20, 50, 100 quid, or whatever they green up for, and they're quite happy with that. Whereby, um, you know, the old days you'd go out and maybe do a couple of grand, but the next day you'd know you've got a good chance of winning three grand. Uh, and they were the swings. Whereas now, because the margins are so tight, it's a lot, obviously a lot, in a lot more favour, uh, for, favourable for the punter, you know, and they never had this good, to be quite honest with you. Um, this is why it's so surprising that take on course has gone, dropped reasonably uh, dramatically over the last couple of years, even though the punter's far better off. Um, no commission, no premium charge, etc., etc. We all know the arguments for that. So I think from my point of view, computers, okay, it makes the things a lot easier. Uh, issuing a ticket, issuing a printed ticket, which I think is good for the punter because they can see exactly you know, what they've had opposed to the old ticket, which just had three numbers on. Um, and also the bookmaker can tell exactly where they are in the book. They know exactly which price to push out. If it flashes because the exchange price is bigger, pull it in. You know, if you like, any Muppet, with all due respect to you know, racecourse workers, any Muppet can work a book. Whereas the art's gone to a certain degree. You know, they've got software now that you can just hit a button um, and it'll say, the, oh, you can green up now for £20, hit this button, you can green up. You can green up for £15, hit this button. Well, that's simple, isn't it, for some people. And they're happy to make £100 over a, you know, on a day. Um, but for traditional bookies, uh, it's a lot harder now. So I don't, I don't like computerisation, although I've gone along with it, which we have to. You know, and it's in some aspects it's okay, other aspects it's 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 bad news for certain bookmakers. Um, of course, I don't, I don't like multi operators. Now, I, I run two pictures of Channel last week, I had two intact, um, but I don't agree with multi operator in, in, in one ring. Um, the old days, you'd have maybe eight, 10, 12 bookmakers turn up in a ring, now you've probably got 20, but those 20 might only be four or five operators. Um, Foss Lass, I think they've only got eight operators, but there might be 30 bookmakers turn up one day, and they've got three, four, five five uh, pitches which you know to me is not right okay different rings if you want one on the rails one in the silver ring and one in tats okay fine that's all right i don't have a problem with that but for, for bookmakers to think right we need to run three pitches now because business isn't as great so we'll have three into one you've got more expenses the race courses are quite happy they're getting their money from it we you know we're to a certain degree we're sort of mules for the race courses really you know channel last week five thousand pound expenses for two pitches you know it's ridiculous Probably 10 years ago, those expenses would have been probably 1,500 quid. So the race courses have cottoned onto this. There's no quarter given there. You, you, you know, your turnover's gone down so much um, that these people feel like they need to have three or four pitches. But then me being a single operator, obviously, if there's three, um, three pitches all in one name and there's me there, you know, I'm being watered down by, well, not quite three quarters, but at least a half. Because there'd be one pitch and me, but now there's three and one. So from my point of view, as a single independent operator, um, and it's probably the same with the shops and, and whatever, you know, of course, the gambling commission have come in and they're charging an arm and a leg. Independents are being priced out in the market. And it's a little bit the same with, with on-course bookmakers. And that's why you don't see too many young lads coming through because A, you, 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 your equipment's probably going to be 10, 15 grand to buy to set up to start off with. And then when you get on course, the margins are not there, obviously better for the punter, but the margins aren't there to, you know, to, to earn a good few bob unless you, you're sort of crafty and streetwise because you, you're playing against people, experienced people who have been left in the game now on course, who know the time of day. So from that point of view, um, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. And for future, I think, um, I mean, the future will still be all right. I th you still have, people still like going to the, to the, to the race courses and bringing out you know, cash, 
Although, albeit they probably don't go to the race courses with as much cash as they used to, you know, and a lot of the boys, I know there's a few that take um, credit cards or debit cards, but not too many, because we all deal with cash, we're a cash society. And as we all know, people don't carry as much cash around now. So that's also a downside. Um, but I still believe that people, punters especially, love going to the race courses. They might draw X amount out of the bank and think, right, okay. And there's no better feeling for a punter to go up to a bookie, even though we might have a face like a smacked ass, going up to a bookie and uh, collecting money off him, you know, and thinking, oh, thanks, Mr. Bookie, that's very nice of you. More so than the credit card and not seeing that cash. You know, so from that point of view, I do think, um, I think punt making, and also obviously with the trotting and the point to points and the dogs, and well, not so much the dogs, but the trotting and the point to point where there's no exterior influence should we say from internet betting prices and everything else i still think they'll be reasonably strong i think uh, you know that's a joy the punters and race goer and owners and trainers alike still like going to these sort of venues because they're not quite sure what price they're going to get on the horse they're not quite sure how much they'll get on um, you know and they've got the variety which is always quite nice really opposed to the you know rigidity of the race course you know on course market as it is so looking back over your career barry would you change anything um, I think I think when buying and selling came in, I think I'd have, I'd have probably instead of being labelled as a journeyman like I am now, I think I'd have probably preferred to have bought better pitches initially with my money, opposed to buying a lot of pitches. I think it might have been more prudent because they've seen to have, the the better pitches have held them the market value, and obviously in theory you make more money out of the better pitches because you're in prime positions, you know, whereby uh, the poorer pitches. Um, now money doesn't flood through to the back line from the front line bookies because all they're doing is having it on the exchanges, having it away, it goes away from the track opposed to filtering back through the, through the, um, through the lines, which was the case when I first bought pitches before the exchanges. Then I think uh, from that point of view, um, yeah, it doesn't, that's not all go well. But in general, we get on with things. So in the sentence, somebody sat watching this, enough money to buy their kit, fancy being a bookie, what would you say? Well, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm, all, I'm always on the positive side, but I'm afraid I can't really see how you're really going to make it pay. So, yes, have a go, dip your toe in the ring, maybe, you know, through the summer, not a problem, but if you're trying to do a, uh, if you're trying to do a year, a 365 year um, uh, occurrence and, and make, make money at it, you can't really. The winter's so hard nowadays. Expenses sort of kill you, really. You know, they've gone through the roof with, with marketing fees and everything else, which uh, another, that's another uh, question altogether. You know, it's, it's, it's very, very hard. You've got to take into account your, your, um, you know, your, your expenses and everything else. Thank you very much, Barry.